Today on Lock Horns, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of one of the most important record labels in extreme metal history. It's an essential albums debate all about earache. Welcome to Lock Horns, Banger TV's live weekly to metal debate show coming to you straight from the Banger Bar at Banger Films. A reminder, we do go live every week if you're watching this in the archive. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. We are racing towards the 100K subscriber mark. So this week, doing something completely different. It's the first Lockhorns episode devoted entirely to a single metal label. And that, of course, is Earache Records, who is celebrating their 30th anniversary in 2017. So this week, it is the 15 essential Earache albums as voted by you. And to help me with that exercise is Banger TV mega superstar, Daniel ZK. <laughs> thank you, Sam. How are you doing, buddy? I'm excellent. Good to see you. Welcome back, man. Well, thank you, and thanks for filling in in my absence. How did it all go yeah, uh, last week? You know, I'm a lot more comfortable on this side of the room, <laughs> I think, and I'm happy that you're back. But it was a lot of fun. It was good to get to know the, uh, the banger audience, and uh, we're all just happy you're well, back, man. Well, from all reports, you did a good job, thanks, so buddy. thanks for filling in, and maybe you haven't left. like. Your, your pajamas behind yeah, the bar? Yeah, I've got a little air mattress behind the bar there. Just let me know who to make the rent check out to, eh? <laughs> okay, well, as you guys know, uh, it's not just about us in the bar. It's about everyone joining us for this uh, essential debate this week. And I want to give some shout outs to people that are joining us once again from around the world. Here we go. We've got bangers joining us from Lithuania, Mexico, Germany, Portugal, Sweden, Netherlands, Venezuela, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Bristol and Brighton in the U UK. And in the US, we've got folks from Texas, New York, North Carolina, California, Louisiana, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Canadians are joining us uh, from Oshawa, Quebec City, Calgary, and Nanaimo from the island, mild stomping ground, and Lockhorns, uh, a Lockhorns virgin from Virginia. Uh, welcome to Kevin. Thanks for joining us uh, for the first time. Well, you know the ground rules here. It's never just about fucking Slayer rules. We actually want to hear why you are saying what you're saying. In other words, if we're choosing the 15 essential earache albums, we want to know uh, why you think they deserve to be part of the canon. And the one limit here is that we're talking about original releases, no re-releases, but we are talking about the full earache catalog. And after watching that intro, man, there's a lot of bands. Yeah, there's they have a ton of bands. Uh, uh, I guess over 30 years, you kind of start to accumulate a lot of good talent on your roster. It's, yep. uh, it's pretty cool. The label's definitely undergone uh, a, a pretty, it has a very rich history, I would say. Yeah in uh, the style of music and the way they've evolved. I'm pretty excited for today. For sure, and we'll get into it, but for a lot of us, uh, you know, Earache it was intrinsic to our discovery of metal. Uh, but we'll get there. Joining us, of course, in the studio is uh, the one, the only, and I've been working on the proper pronunciation <laughs> of her last name for uh, years now, Lisa Latasseur. Thanks, Sam Dunn. Oh, good to see you. Good to see you, welcome back. Thanks for having me back. Uh, yeah, I was in Texas shooting with a band called ZZ Top. Pretty cool, kind of fun. Totally anyway, fun. We were having uh, fun without you, but we're glad to have you back. <laughs> um, and of course, you're equipped with the cowbell from hell. I am. And uh, yeah, that's Something what like we that. do. We ring the bell. <laughs> uh, Daniel, so let's talk about your ache. Um, give me a little background on your relationship with I, Earache <laughs> Records as a metalhead. Yeah, uh, the kind of my love affair with Earache started with some of their more accessible bands, I suppose the, the Morbid Angels and Carcass type bands. I was also uh, friends with a uh, local band Cauldron when they mm -hmm. got signed to Earache. Right. So that kind of made me even more interested in the stuff that, uh, you know, the deeper stuff in their catalog. Um, but I think it, it was cool. I'd always been listening to the more mainstream forms of metal and the really accessible stuff on the bigger labels and Earache was really my first introduction to the really extreme stuff. Right. Um, and of course I'd never heard Grindcore in my life before I'd heard Napalm Death. Right. Um, so Earache was a very important stepping stone for me in my, my uh, discovery and the deeper I dived into extreme metal. Right. Well, I mean, little mini history here, of course, founded in 85. First record released on Earache was in 87. That, of course, is the... Uh 
legendary uh, Napalm Death. Scum, of course, one of the coolest things that they did. Every label has its own, uh, uh, I don't know what to call it, identifier, and it was Mosh. Zero, zero, 001 yeah. couldn't get more metal than that we thought that was pretty cool when we were teenagers and of course originally the label cut its teeth on on grindcore some of the really seminal um early death metal records and crossing that line into some sort of uh some some industrial and more noise uh territory and you know here we are in 2017 celebrating the 30th anniversary and of course the label has uh, become much more than just uh, an extreme metal stalwart they've got a pretty uh diverse catalog uh to to, to brag about so lots to say but um Let's get started with the legend. We know the protocol here at Lockhorns. When we do our essential albums or we debate the heavy metal family tree, we like to start with the legend. And I think it's tough uh, to dispute this one, but I, I think by my estimation, and I would wager by a lot of comments that are coming in, um, Napalm Death uh, Scum, is a big one. A uh, little bit of background here. I mean, put it this way, there's no record that sounds like Napalm Death Scum. Uh, and still to this day, forget it, in 1987, uh, really unique blend of metal, of punk, of, um, you know, lots of really short songs. And, and, and what's noteworthy here is a lot of really politically motivated lyrics, which at the time, you know, unless you were a punk band, uh, doing something that was overtly political and extreme in a metal sort of way wasn't sort of de rigueur. And that, that's, I think, to me, what was really important uh, about this record. Is there anything you want to add, Daniel, before we go to a clip? Yeah, or? I, I think it's just the, the raw, the sheer aggression, the, the, the noise element, the drums kind of really almost uh, directing the music, even overpowering the riffs, uh, mm -hmm. as you say, the political the imagery from the album art to the lyrical content. Uh, it just was the fastest music, I think, that anyone yep. had heard. And of course, really unique story. I mean, it's been told before, John Peel, the legendary uh, broadcaster for the BBC, uh, picked this record yes. uh, for one of his Peel sessions, and that really exposed Napalm Death to a broader range of ears than just sort of the the metal diehards and I think that sort of set Napalm Death on a path that was pretty unique from the very beginning that this was an extreme band that a lot of people had heard of yes. and, and you may not necessarily own a Napalm Death record but a lot of people especially in the UK uh, knew uh, that this band existed, which is not the case for a lot of extreme bands. But in any case, uh, we're going to go to a clip here. I did get the opportunity to interview uh, founder of Eric Records, uh, Digby Pearson, when we did the extreme metal episode for uh, Metal Evolution. So here's a clip from Digby. Coming back to Napalm Death and Scum, what was the impact of that record? Well, you feel it today. It's like monumental. It kind of, um, I mean, at the time, not much. Mm. But over the course of time, mm -hmm. I mean, Extreme Metal came from that record, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, it defined what it is. Napalm Death suffered a few lineup changes straight after. I mean, they were caught in the, the vortex of this thing. That's why the members, if you, I mean, they went through revolving door of members, you know, for, for a while. Yes. Because the pace would, uh, was so, um, well, it was so fast. They went from just playing The Mermaid upstairs to 20 people mm -hmm. to being on the BBC. Right. <laughs> it was bizarre. So they were the breakthrough. That record was the breakthrough. Yeah. Although effectively it took the follow-up Napalm Death album, yeah. um, which was about a year later, to actually make the big breakthrough retail-wise. Yeah. The second album from Enslavement mm. to Obliteration. Can you talk, I mean, my understanding is that this, this shoots up the charts. Mm. Um, the, yeah. the cover of the NME yeah. um, uh, happens as well. So mm. can you talk about uh, the, how big that record was for the band? Mm. I knew this was a big record, and um, I mean, remarkably, it went to number one in the UK indie charts. I mean, that was, I mean, Scum had been like 17 or something. Right. Like, it was there, but not groundbreaking. And noticeably, notably, it was above New Order, you know, the new album, I think, at the time. And um, that's when things kind of went ballistic. It was like, you know, people monitor that chart, you know, for, for UK trends and, yeah. and buzz bands yeah. and it was like unbelievable something so noisy and extreme what is that doing at the top of the charts yeah. 
So there we have Digby giving us his uh, little bit of a backstory on, on Napalm Death and, and the label and how that all came together. Uh, Lisa, we're going to go to the board. I think we've got some we comments. Have lots of Napalm Death. Okay, here we go. Let's go to the board for Napalm Death. First up is Kieran Llewellyn, who says, there are so many earache masterpieces. The album I'll have to choose, though, is the album that really got them running. Scum by Napalm Death. The album is an all-out unrelenting, is all-out unrelenting and in your face. Uh, Alvadas Bumaika says, uh, I see Scum is the album that set the standard for extreme music. Manan uh, Dedia says, Scum show that metalheads aren't idiots. We can think about the world around us. Napalm Death brought that level of intelligence into our world that the outside world chose to ignore. I remember when I interviewed Barney uh, for Global Metal, I asked him, what would you be doing if you weren't in, uh, in Napalm Death? And he said, I'd be a social worker. Crazy. That's not an answer you get from most metalheads. So Metal Shirt Collector says, the first group and album I think of when I hear Earache Records or see the logo is Scum, a legendary album in itself, aggressive of tendencies, aka Brad Zordrager, uh, is infiltrating the chat. Says, I think it's interesting that both sides of Scum featured a different vocalist. Good point. Both legends in their own ways. The fact they got uh, Barney Greenway later and kept killing it shows how solid they are. It's like try doing a family tree of like even like the first couple years of Napalm yeah, Death, yeah. and it's like it makes our heavy metal family tree look like uh, child's play. Uh, and down here we've got Horror Master. Since you guys fucked up in putting Scum as the legend in the Essential Grindcore albums, you finally gave Scum the spot it deserves. Well, it's not the last time we're gonna fuck up on the Horns, let me tell you that much. Uh, so there you go. Lisa? You think it's that simple? It's never that simple. They is put it? out other records. I've heard. I've heard. <laughs> uh, okay, here we go. The, the chat continues. Uh, Delicious Dishes says, I'm sh unsure if Scum is more essential. From Enslavement is the better album, in my opinion. And we had uh, we had both on the grind on, on the grind episode. You're right. My vote definitely goes to From Enslavement as the more essential album. Fight me on that one. That's what it's all about. Daniel Crow, Napalm Death, totally deserve to have two albums on this list. All right. Scum is the classic, the most important and influential grindcore album, without a doubt. But from enslavement to obliteration is a better album. It showed more range, that you could slow everything down, take some time, and still be punishment, uh, punishing. So yeah, we've got a, a magnet for From Enslavement here. Um, Want to weigh in? Yeah, so, so here's my thing. Uh, definitely we, we don't need to limit uh, you know, a band to having just one album on the board. Yeah. But for me, the importance that we're doing an episode about Earache Records and the importance of having Scum as the legend is really, for me, it's more about the humble beginnings of the label. We're talking about Dig starting a, a label in his bedroom, essentially, signing bands that no one else was interested in signing. This music was too extreme for other labels, mm -hmm. and it really you know, had no place on a mainstream label so Dig created a home for it, and that's why, for me, Scum is the obvious choice as the legend. You make a good point, because we're actually not talking about the, the legendary albums of Napalm Death. Right. We're talking about the legendary albums of a record label, which is a totally different debate, and I, I think it's hard to argue against putting the first record. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm overlooking something. I am blonde, uh, but uh, it strikes me that uh, that's a hard debate. I mean, debating the, mo the essential albums of Napalm Death, different story. Absolutely. I mean, I would not disagree from enslavement to obliteration. Uh, showing maturity, diversifying the tempos without question. I don't think anyone would question the fact that it's a better album from a, a songwriting perspective. Uh, totally. But and Scum he, is just all out fucking napalm death. Dude, and it's the, it's the beginning and, you know, just the way it's put together too, like what Bradley said. It's right. literally, it's two sessions. It's, it was never recorded in one sitting. It's two, she two sessions with two different lineups. Yep. It's just, it's the start of it all and that for me is why it's the legend. Okay, well let's, we'll leave two up there. Sure. We'll give Barney and Co. their moment in the <laughs> sun. Not sure if two will survive uh, out, of, uh, out of the 15 we're limited to, but let's, uh, let's start there. Uh, what's up next, Lisa? Well, we have a lot of bands to get through, but we like to be nice. 
a mm. little bit nice on the show, and we give the first pick to our guest. So it's time for guest <gasps> choice. There you go. Okay, Daniel DK. I, I, I can have a pick. Your, your, your crowning moment. All right. Uh, well, for me, uh, the label, obviously, to do with my age as well, for the impressionable time, too, was 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, and this kick ass band from the UK called Evile had come onto the scene. And uh, they were bringing back my favorite style of metal, which was thrash in a way that I had never heard it. They had Fleming Rasmussen of Metallica fame in the right. producer's chair. Um, and this record, dude, it is like everything I love about thrash on steroids. It's some of the best guitar playing, the riffs, the vocal, the lyrical content was like absolutely right up my alley. It was about banging your head and getting in a mosh pit and, you know, all sorts of dark imagery. Like, mm -hmm. look at the cover, man. Yep. Um, it's totally tight record, start to finish. And it means a lot to me. And that's why it is my guest. Very choice. cool. Well, I mean, this is showing, I guess, the scope of the label over several decades. I mean, Evil, a very different band than, than where Earache started uh, back in the 70s and just kind of gives you a perspective on how much the label has contributed uh, to metal and, and uh, really has embraced a lot of the different styles of metal as well. So there we go, Evil. We've kind of got both ends of the spectrum yeah. here. Uh, I kind of got to feel there's a lot, lot to fill in here, but I think we have some comments on Evil. Lisa, am I right? Couple. Okay, here we go. Nick Ottaviano is back. Enter the Grave was the record that put Earache back on the metal map. All right. I like this it, guy. It was what I believe kickstarted the Earache Renaissance, a classic in modern thrash. That's right. Like, this label 100%. began to be associated with this this sort of uh, thrash redux uh, moment in time, if you will. Yeah, the thrashing like a maniac. We, we talked about it on the yep. thrash episode. Sure. It was totally the resurgence and the, the new wave yep. of thrash metal. Exactly, a younger generation of musicians really uh, taking their cues from uh, Nuclear Assault totally. and, and a few other uh, classics from the Bay Area and beyond and doing their own thing with it. We've got more comments on Eva. I've got uh, Drowned in Black says, I saw Eva with Municipal Waste and SSS and they could not hang. Okay, Brian Alvarez, I never thought I'd see Eva mentioned here, but that album cooks. Tunnel Snakes rule, Enter the Grave is important for the Thrash revival, but their last album, Skull, is their best. Well, again, maybe the best for the band, some debate there, but if we're talking about an album, as was mentioned, that sort of signaled this transition in the labels, trajectory, uh, yeah, seems like Enter the Grave totally. is a wise choice. Yes, Lisa? We've got one more before, uh, you know, before we get too far. Before we settle the score, Corvo yeah. the Exterminator said one of my favorite Voivod songs, as I always like to point out, you can put Evil on there if you want, as long as it is somewhere near the bottom. Hey man, I'm, I'm not gonna be one to argue that. You can't uh, compare it to the, the legends that it's sitting beside, but I mean, you know, I think it just ended up there because it was uh, my guest choice. But you can move it if you want, man. You could come down here and Dude, slide. we're leaving it at the top. We gotta <laughs> give it its moment here because we got a lot of ground to cover in the hour. Speaking of that, where are we going next, Lisa? Right, so uh, this big jump between Napalm Death and Evile, and the way we're gonna do this, we have about 40 minutes. Okay. And we have 30 years. Here we go. Warm so, up's over. Uh, we're going to do this by decade. We're going to tackle the 1980s Eric records okay. and move forward in time. Okay. So if you've got comments on the classic era, we want to hear them. We have some uh, already noted, and it seems that the 180s band people want the most is... Um, Bolt Thrower, Realm of Chaos. Okay, here we go. 80s, we got three years to work with, 87, 88, 89. So let's get on with it. Artur Felipe Castana, Bolt Thrower, Realm of Chaos is an album that transcended genres. And every time I play Warhammer, Bolt Thrower is always my soundtrack. Realms of Chaos by Earache uh, is an all time must. Rob Naylor, Through the Eye of Chaos is the heaviest guitar tone ever put to record. Made uh, Realm of Chaos even better than it already was. Warhammer was born to be made uh, into uh, death metal records. North Atlantic Tattoo, I like Bolt Thrower better at a mid pace, so Realm of Chaos is not the one for me. It's good, but we lost the feed. I like the Fourth Crusade and For Victory uh, the most. And here we got Jesse Ruth in the mid-90s. Bolt Thrower, Realm of Chaos uh, was a gateway drug for a hair metal dude. Full confession. Uh, I, lo I love, still love Rat. 
don't we all, yeah. uh, round and round? Uh, but bolt thrower is pure catharsis in an age of Trump. Catharsis is required daily. I never thought we'd hear the words rat and bolt thrower in the same sentence, no. but there we Only go. Only on lock horns. Any, <laughs> any comments here from, from you, Daniel? Or? Totally. Yeah. Uh, I think it's an incredible record. Yeah. Uh, specifically, someone mentioned the guitar sounds. Uh, kind of the whole like a foggy style of production on that record and the way the guitars are doubled It kind of has this natural reverb sound to it. It really just makes the riffs kind of hit you in the head yeah. Love this record. It's uh, an unbelievable choice and my favorite bolt thrower record by far from the catalog People who like bolt thrower really fucking like bolt thrower oh, yeah. in the sense they're kind of like outside just outside the main conversation when right. it comes to like death metal or grindcore or earache, but people People abide by this band. Absolutely. And you're the same, yeah. yeah, it's like you're all in or you've you've never heard of Kinda them seems essentially. That way. Totally. There's, man. A There's always a rallying cry for bolt thrower and it's loud. Okay, Lisa, what's next? Let's let's Keep it going. Okay, we got more Bolt Thrower. Manix. Bolt Thrower was the best death metal record. Uh, but in 1989, Terrorizer yes. had the most influential grindcore record besides Napalm Death uh, with the Terrorizer album World Downfall. And Mikhail Lopez, Terrorizer World Downfall, easily in the top five of grindcore essential albums. And I have it here somewhere. There it is. Terrorizer uh, World Downfall. Go. Now, now, yeah, so their first record uh, totally sticks with what we're talking about with Scum and Napalm Death, the political imagery. Um, if you're a guitar player like I am, this record screamed to me. It had killer riffs. Uh, for me, it was a guitar-driven record. I like that uh, the tempos are kind of all over the place. It's got really heavy stuff and fast stuff and some more mid-tempo mosh stuff. Uh, huge fan of this record. It fucking slays. There you go. Well, I'm going to jump the gun a little bit here because we don't have a magnet for this. But I brought this little gem in when we did our uh, early death metal uh, essential albums debate. For a lot of us, it was the early Eric Records uh, Grind Crusher Mosh 12 compilation that introduced a lot of us to these bands, including Terrorizer. The first time I heard Terrorizer was right off this compilation and, uh, you know, Compilations maybe don't qualify for the discussion, but uh, uh, well, why wouldn't they? Well, I want to hear. Does anybody is anybody worship at the altar of the grind crusher uh, <laughs> compilation as much uh, as I did? It was a kind of gateway. It was the gateway drug to um, a lot of earache bands that uh, I guess were slightly lesser known. I had heard Morbid Angel. I had heard uh, Napalm Death, but bands like. Terrorizer at the time, Filthy Christians, and others were, were unfamiliar to me. So there you go. I'm just kind of perching that ominously on the ledge of earache legendariness to see what everyone has to say. Here we got Mecco Butler says, Grind Crusher comp for spreading the news to the world that Thrash is dead. Ross Johnson, Grind Crusher sampler, introduced me to so many awesome bands. Repulsion, I forgot they were on that. Fucking amazing. Godflesh. Napalm, Carcass, Terrorizer, and at a budget price, which mattered so much when you were 14. <laughs> uh, greatest bargain ever. Cool. All right. So, Lisa. Well, I don't get a pick on Lockhorn shows for a good re for a good reason, but um, except maybe next week. <laughs> but um, if I did have a pick. Mm -hmm. It would be Godflesh. Okay, Mikhail Lopez says, Godflesh, Street Cleaner, the album that set the standard for industrial metal, post-metal, and drone. Few albums more essentially th than this. And Ross Johnson uh, states, Godflesh, Street Cleaner, years ahead of its time, so heavy in a completely different way. I don't think you can dispute, and what a fucking Dude, great know. album cover. Uh, I found that fight. Lisa, so... Lisa should get more picks, I think. Uh, it's that, a yeah. wicked record and yeah. totally outside the realm of what I think fans of extreme metal you'd expect them to be listening to. It's yeah. as said, it's droney. The riffs are super slow and drone, yet super powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, it's uh, heavy in the drum machine. Yeah. It's got uh, a wicked blend of electronica and like weird techno and metal vibes. It's just totally outside of the box but remains so fucking heavy throughout obviously yep. like these like chaotic like really angry negative death metal vocal sounds yep. like very cool record i think what's cool about it too is sort of them coming back to the label earache i mean earache was always an interesting label in the sense that it was like metal was at the center 
But you had bands like Napalm Death with its more punk influence with the very socially and politically motivated lyrics. And then you had a band like Godflesh, which was, sure it was metal, but it had so many other elements that were kind of uh, outside the main lane, I guess, uh, if you will, of extreme metal with the uh, the drum sounds and, and the overall kind of aesthetic of the album was very different. So it always seemed like Earache was a, a, a label from the beginning Although grounded in metal, they were always willing to, uh, to, to expand beyond that. But anyway, uh, that's Godflesh. Good job, Lisa. Yeah. Industrial metal I, I at its have, finest. I may have favorited those comments. <laughs> but if you don't want Godflesh, you can tell us. You can take the man home. I will listen to you. <laughs> yeah, she'll but, take it home. Um, yeah. <laughs> I may not like you, but I will listen to you. Uh, Sam also doesn't get a pick, but I don't think that you would argue with uh, the band... Uh, the chat wants us to add next. Yeah, well, I don't think you can have a conversation about Earache Records without mentioning this album, Morbid Angel. Altars of Madness, of course, this came up a lot in our early death metal essential albums uh, debate. Uh, I'll go to the boards first because yeah. I won't be able to stop. Machine Dead says Altars of Madness is missing. Old school evil brutality from 1989. Nicholas Ottaviano, Altars of Madness time yet? If you need to know why, watch literally any previous Lockhorns episode yet. You called us out. Uh, Arthur Felipe Castana, Altars of Madness. Uh, they were the first American band that Digby signed to Earache. That's a good point. I'd forgotten point. about that. And made Morbid Angel ready for a European audience. Machine Dead, uh, if Altars of Madness doesn't get up there, Trey Azagtooth will really cut all of your balls off. Our balls, your balls. Not sure which. Do it for the love of our balls. Everyone's balls. We're doing all of this for the love of our balls. Uh, that goes without saying. Joseph, send Zick. I understand the influence and historical importance of altars, but I've never been able to enjoy it that much. I find that many death metal bands have taken that formula and done it better. Give me your thoughts, Daniel. Uh, for me, if there was any confusion as to what the fuck old school death metal was supposed to sound like, right. this was it. It had... Uh, I think like a, just a new level of uh, complexity in its songwriting. Yeah. Um, obviously, some of the most evil uh, vocal styles. You hear a lot of growling and a lot of screaming in the genre. But uh, for me, the vocal style on Alters is like super evil, and it just cuts through to me. It just yeah. it made sense to me, and I love the songwriting. Uh, for me, it is one of the most crushing of the old school death yeah. metal records. And I, I gotta say, I've been listening to this record recently because we've been doing these shows going back to this period, and the production really stands up. If you listen to this record next to other records from '89 and around that time. It's pretty fucking solid. And I will say, just adding, there was also that element from Morbid Angel with Trey's riffs, uh, having that kind of almost uh, progressive element to it. There was always that, that aspect of the, of the guitar playing that was slightly off kilter. It was never just sort of like straight down the barrel death metal. And the other fact too was there was kind of this occultic lyrical content yes. like David Vincent the art was, too, yeah man. was was sort of he was conjuring spirits from like lost ancient yeah. worlds and and I think just again it's about context it might not be the best death metal record by some people's judgment but I think at the time in 1989 uh, it's really hard to beat <laughs> We've only made it to 1989, guys. <laughs> you picked the wrong guys yeah, to do this. We got a few more decades. <laughs> um, I think one band that might get us get us moving forward in time is, uh, is Carcass. Okay, Carcass. Well, Carcass, UK band, of course, straddles the 80s and 90s and has a pretty impressive catalog. Here we go, Carcass. Nick Ottaviano, Heartwork is an absolute masterpiece and a classic of metal as a whole. Looking at uh, the 30-year legacy, this is the record that is most synonymous with Earache Records. Hmm. Interesting. And I feel that Heartwork and Scum could throw fists for the legend title. Yeah, Carcass were a huge flag for Earache throughout their whole 90s career. Hannah Klein, welcome back. Heartwork needs to be on the list for sure. As one of the most influential transition works in the scene, it bridged gore grind and death metal with a more melodic approach, approach helping kickstart the entire mellow death scene that would explode only years later. Full Metal Guy says Symphonies of Sickness needs to be there. It was the birth of Death Grind, one of the sickest, most brutal albums ever put to record. Check out the cover. 
Matt Bolt, I would argue that Reek of Putrefaction <laughs> is a more important earache release than Heartwork. That record started the gore grind genre, which I believe has influenced every gore grind band as well as other genres like porno grind. I bet there are more bands overall who are influenced by Reek of Putrefaction's overall than, than, than Heartwork any day. Interesting point. I gotta breathe. Weigh in, first of all, hard work, Daniel. Uh, dude, uh, I mean, we could do an episode all about Carcass, I feel, even with a small discography, but yep. um, hard work for me is the record. Um, mm. Once again, as a guitar player, I think Michael Lamott's work on it is absolutely stellar. Um, I think that uh, the way it's like this polished, melodic death metal, uh, like with this mainstream sensibility in the songwriting, but it doesn't lose any of its heaviness. It never, it never goes into that realm too much, but it's, it's always in the back of your head. These songs are well structured. The production is unreal. Yeah. Um, it just, this record leaves me with a smile on my face every time I listen to it. And uh, I love it. I absolutely love this Phenomenal record. It's perfect. record. Uh, although, you know, it could be argued that the early I would argue, actually, if there's any band that could have two records as part of the best 15 of Eric, I think it would be Carcass, primarily because you're really talking about two entry points into two very different styles of metal, and that's pretty rare, and it's really within just a, a few years of each other. So I would argue that maybe th we, we, could, we could see two Carcass records up here, but Lisa... I'm what trying to sort this out. Okay. I don't want this to be another Cannibal Corpse episode where right. the votes are so split, none of them end up on the tree. Right. So um, we actually have a clip from Digby talking about Carcass, which we'll go to while we try and read your com comments and, and figure out uh, which record. Yep. Here we go. More from Digby on Dig. Carcass. Did they get banned in Germany? Um, I was banned everywhere. I mean, it's kind of... We had to... I mean, they didn't sell any records. They had notoriety. They had millions of clones pop up, carcass mm. clones. Mm. That's the thing they don't really get, I suppose. But we couldn't sell our record anywhere. It had to come shrink-wrapped in some black thing, and then only certain shops would take it, like the indie shops mm. typically would support it. Major chains, no chance. I mean, for a while in the mid-90s, both those albums came out as just hand-drawn, just a spine on the sleeve with a bit of a brain, a kind of an anatomical drawing. Mm. For, to tone down the whole, just so we could sell some records really in the major chains because mm -hmm. they refused to take the gore mm -hmm. sleeves. They were just not acceptable. So, mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, the downside was they never sold any records until Heartwork. What did Heartwork sound like? Was it, was it, was oh. it an album that could uh, yeah. be accessible? We thought it sounded to our ears as commercial as Megadeth. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, I th and Columbia thought likewise. They could go, this is just the next, a couple of notches on more, more brutal but it's still uh, got a melodic sensibility. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like attack the listener too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but looking back on it now, I mean, we're releasing Heartwork again for the umpteenth time uh, this month. And it's uh, from the original tapes. And it gives it more dynamism than it had mm. in many of the versions that's been released, which were more, uh, um, uh, the sound was sort of manipulated to be more crushing. Yeah. So the, the fully dynamic, range edition we're putting out yep. is a real uh, breath, breath of fresh air. You can hear the solos leap out and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But it was the first time I'd heard it properly for, for many years. Mm -hmm. And it's still extreme. I mean, this is what was, I don't know what, what we were on at the time, but we thought it was like uh, gonna join the big four. But it was nothing like it, really. Well, there you go. Never short of words uh, <laughs> for Carcass from Digby, uh, nor from us. So let's be clear, we're getting a lot of debate around Carcass and to Lisa's point, we don't want another cannibal corpse gate, <laughs> which we had uh, a couple weeks ago where no cannibal corpse records ended up here because no one could agree. Wasn't our fault. We're not disputing that cannibal corpse wasn't a death metal band. 
you guys couldn't agree, but I digress. Anyway, we've got Carcass up here. I want to get Symphonies of Sickness mentioned as well as Necroticism, but currently we have Heartwork and Reek of Putrefaction magnets there as well. So maybe I'm, as things progress, we're going to have to shake this down. I'm feeling that Heartwork is the overwhelming uh, choice. Okay, here. let's go back to the board. Time Signature MMA. Heartwork is an essential since it was pretty much the birth of Mellow Death. Jake Hall. How is this a fucking debate? Heartwork needs to get on there. They pretty much, it, I should say, pretty much invented mel melodic death metal. Drowned in Black, Heartwork is Earache's best-selling record. Interesting. I would have thought it would have been Slaughter of the Soul, but what do I know? HR, uh, The Flame Blades Wielder, two Carcass albums are no-brainers. They have to be Heartwork and Reek of Putrefaction. They were both hugely influential in their respective genres and show the two polar opposites in their sound. Luca Fallon, the answer is Heartwork. The greatest melodic death metal album of all time and the most important metal album of the 90s. All hail Carcass. We'll pull off Reek, we'll leave Heartwork on there, and if, it, if we get down to the wire... Well, we're just gearing up for our carcass episode yeah, over here, man. That's right. It's all about future planning. We're future-proofing uh, uh, Lockhorns here, a carcass episode. Maybe when the next record comes out, that's it. we'll do that. Because, because Surgical Steel Slade. Exactly. We haven't even talked about Surgical Steel, but anyway, different label. That's, that's why it. we're not talking about it. So it makes it a little easier for us. Lisa... Time to move on from Carcass? Yeah, we're going to move on, and we're going to try not to repeat the grindcore and death metal album shows that Fair we've already enough. done. Yeah. There's definitely some crossover. Right. So don't worry. We're going to get to all those other bands, but since we're in the 90s, we can't go any further now without talking about Slaughter of the Soul. Here we go. Okay, At the Gates, Slaughter of the Soul, probably uh, one of the most important extreme metal albums of all time, certainly of the 90s and manifests itself still to this day in so many metal bands. Here we go, Horror Master, Slaughter of the Soul is the greatest melodic death metal album of all time. Uh, it's not a death metal album. It's melodic death metal al album. You stupid idiot. Stupid idiot. You're starting to sound like my mother. Uh, Nick Ottaviano, Earache must be proud to have put out such an important and influential record, one that literally changes the game for over 20 years. Earache snatching up at the gates and pushing them to their musical peak resulted in the musical landmark for both parties. Uh, yeah. That you dude. go, because I talk about this record ah, all the time. Ah, man, what is there to say? It's yeah. Slaughter of the Soul. It's perfect from the opening notes, the opening sounds, I should say. It's, it's perfect in all ways. It defined the Gothenburg sound for me and for the majority of metalheads, I think. Um, it's becoming a cliche, but I agree. It's, ah, dude, to it's me, so it's just good. about as close as you can get to a perfect metal record. Yeah, I think it, I think I would take the leap and say it is a perfect it's metal record. It's got the, the 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 guitar sound, the songwriting, the vocal note still to this day Lindbergh stands as one of the most phenomenal vocals in extreme metal. You, you can understand what he's saying too. Yeah. Uh, and a point I've heard you make before is that you, people sing along to their yeah. songs. At and the, the show. production on the, the record was phenomenal. Ah, oh, dude. Anyway, it's, let's it's just, a perfect fucking let's record. Just, let's just end the show. I'm gonna just drop my marker. Yeah. But let's not. We got time. We got to do more. What are we doing, Lisa? Well, Slaughter of the Soul It's is sort of like a duh, right? <laughs> well, it's called Lock Horns, so we always want to hear from people who disagree with us. We honestly do. Right. But in this case, they're just, uh, they're just not. <laughs> there isn't. It doesn't exist. There's got, no locking horns on Slaughter of the Soul. We've got Brad in here trying to, like, make a case for it. It's like, relax. Okay, don't we worry. Got, we got oh, yeah. this. Yeah, it's, it just, I don't think Chill anyone's going to oppose. It's on the board. Yeah, it's not coming off. Uh, you're gonna have to come down here and physically remove my hand from the magnet if you think it doesn't belong. So, Lisa, uh, what does that mean? Where are we going now? Uh, I'm trying Since to make. That was so easy. I'm trying to make sense of it. Here are some of the '90s bands that I'm seeing come up. I'd love to hear some more strong arguments for and against. Um, uh, Brutal Truth. Yep. Uh, the Haunted. Yep. Sleep Cathedral. Like, let's talk about some of those bands. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about, where do you want to start, Daniel? Well, you were just talking about the guitar tone on Slaughter the Soul, yeah. and I think a very similar guitar tone, mm -hmm. and one that precedes it, uh, kind of one of the originators in that buzzsaw tone, yeah. Yeah. is Entombed. Um, yeah. Left Hand Path. Yeah. Uh, totally, for me, once again, I always go back to this guitar thing. I'm a guitar player, it's not my fault. 
The guitar tone on this record is unbelievable, and when you kind of watch the making of the record, it was really mm. simple. It was like cheap, cheap gear, cheap overdrive pedal into a PV amp. Um, this record for me is a perfect record from that era. I fucking love it. It's heavy as fuck, and that guitar tone is crushing and undeniable. For yep. that guitar tone alone, I think it belongs on this board. I agree. I've got the vinyl next door to the banger bar here. I mean, for me, in Left Hand Path was one of the best death metal records from that time. I mean, next to Altars of Madness, I wore the fuck out of this thing and spent a lot of time may or may not have been stoned staring at this album cover and uh, oogling over the work of uh, Dan Seagrave, who of course also did, did uh, Altars of Madness. It's the, I find that the artwork kind of really represents the sound of the record too, like uh, very spacey and yeah. a, lot, a lot of room between the instruments. Kind of get that with this like forest graveyard vibe. And, More of uh, a horror kind of soundtrack kind of vibe to this record. I would say totally. it invoked more of a more of a mood and an atmosphere than say it's an alter, totally. uh, than more of a, than say an Altars of Madness. It was a less technical record. Uh, as you said, there was a more there was more space yeah. to the songs and maybe just a little bit more time to absorb the texture of the sound uh, rather than the technical complexity. And but Yes. So important for the Swedish death metal sound, yeah. that's all I'm going to yeah. say. Okay, left hand path. You let us, you let the late lead I know, out. I know. You just left us t to talk about in tune. <laughs> I that, know. That, that's like... I try not to you like... Can't, you, it, can't, you can't do that. If you <laughs> wanted a fast show, you picked the wrong guys. <laughs> okay, so we're going to the board. Do we want to hear what the board has to say, Lisa? We always want to hear what the board has to Kevin say. Kevin Seller <laughs> says, now that you've got Slaughter of the Soul, you can't go any further without left, left hand path. Ah, Croft, fuck. Apocrypha of Oblivion. You're slaughtering my soul. Where the fuck is Left Hand Path already? It demonstrates a young band taking a genre, slowing it down, speeding it up. It lends uh, from punk and that fucking guitar tone that Daniel talked about. Cameron, uh, great crib. Left Hand Path, very essential. Erupting out of Sweden in 1990 that paved the path probably the pun was intended, for many other 90s death metal bands where they're even louder and heavier bass rattle and grisly uh, guitars. Good so word. there you go. Rattle. So what you see here is lovely artwork that has been pre-prepared with love by the Banger team because these were the records that came up most in our Facebook uh, polls before yep. the show and also some we had from previous episodes. But there are lots of bands that we hadn't guessed mm -hmm. in advance. Uh, and we want to be open to all of those yeah. um, moving forward in time. And one that's coming up quite a bit uh, is Nocturnus. Nocturnus, the key. Okay. Um, let's see guys, what the board has to say. Do you guys know say. this record? Uh, I don't know this record, sadly. So let's uh, let's get familiar. Garrick Ship, Nocturnus, the key. First death metal band with keyboards, and actually got it right. Plus, it's a rare sci-fi concept album in the genre. Also an important album for early technical death metal music, despite not being wholly part of the genre due to the endless riff changes and super fast solos. Greg Quady, or Quaddy says, I Say the Key by Nocturnus AD should earn a mention. It was a very unique death metal album at the time it was released. As for the four albums in the picture, I love almost all of them. Uh, Napalm Death never did much for me. Fair enough. Heavy metal original. If The Key by Nocturnus is not here, it will be a travesty. Absolute masterpiece of old school progressive tech death. Awesome riffs, blistering technical solos, and the use of keyboards synth. Do you know this record? No, dude, okay. I, I, I don't know this record, but I think that the beauty of the show is that it's all about the, the group chat and yep. the you know people sitting at home tuning in. And if they want to see that record up there, I think we owe it to them to put that record up well, there. Well, there we right? go. I've written Nocturnus up on the board. And, you know, if you want to make the top 15, we're going to need, I think, to hear some more support for the Nocturnus record. Pe clearly, the people that like it think it's essential, but um, we try to be dem uh, democratic here as much as we can. So chime in if you want to see it in the essential list. Lisa, is this another? Yeah, uh, two things. I, I asked the chat uh, what year it's out, because when I'm here, I, can't, I don't have Google open. Apparently, it's yeah. from 1990. OK. So we've had a long time to get with the program here. Um, but of course, it's Lockhorn's. Not everyone agrees. Right. 
Simon Dawes says, fuck everything with bad production, even an 11 year old like myself. Whoa. Whoa. Watch your mouth, young Can't man. Can't effing listen to SHIT like Nocturnus. <laughs> Love lots of the music, but hate the production. All right. Well, even 11 year olds have opinions. Dude, 11 year olds have yours too. <laughs> Officially the youngest viewer. Of, uh, of, of lock horns. Okay, so Lisa, let's just step back, take stock a little bit here. I think, I think there's some concern. Uh, bolt thrower, evil, napalm death scum. I might pull this out to make some room. Really, are we gonna have two napalm death albums? Not so sure. Terrorizer, a lot of support. God flesh, morbid angel, heart work. Uh, Slot of the Soul and Left Hand Path. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Leaving six or five, if you like my Grind Crusher uh, vinyl lingering down below. Here in the margins, Symphonies of Sickness, a Necroticism, and uh, Reek of Putrefaction, the Nocturnus record, and uh, we've got Napalm Death uh, from Enslavement to Obliteration. Um, there's so many things coming up now from all over the decades, but I think right. the two that we have to address, I was going to say, shit, we're almost out of time. We can't be almost out of time. We're still in the 90s, is uh, Sleep and Cathedral. Okay. Do cool. we have, I mean, we love those bands, but do we have an you essential guys are album? Stoned. Do we have an essential <laughs> album here, guys? Okay, here we go. Nate Kicks, Sleep's Holy Mountain. It's held up over time and has proven to be influential. Also, it was different to the other bands on Eric's roster at the time. Uh, and Time Signature, MMA, the first Cathedral album should definitely be added. It was one of the slowest and most oppressive doom metal albums released at the time. And we've got another comment here uh, for Sleep's Holy Mountain from Quarter Massic saying, not the most extreme album on the Eric's lineup, but very important for bringing another sound into the Eric family. Very important album for Stoner slash Doom metal. Okay, well here we go, Daniel. Yeah, that's why I we've say got cathedral and we've got sleep. You guys must be stoned. You're throwing out these awesome like droney stony records that I love. Uh, it's a cool story behind uh, the sleep record is I believe it was a demo that was sent to Earache in a right. total demo form. Hey, you interested in this? And Earache put it out as is because they thought it was so badass. Cool. Um, yep. I think it's totally different from the other stuff in Sleep's discography as well. Less drone, more into like this, like a little more riffy. Like mm -hmm. it's got like a, a little more cannabis, uh, definitely a, a cannabis thing yep, going on it. here with the artwork yep. and, the, and the stoner lyrics. Um, as well as the, the Cathedral record, another great record. Super, super doomy, yes, but a little bit experimental with its use, I find, of uh, it's not always so heavy. It's got like uh, keys and mm -hmm. flutes. Uh, it's got clean guitar, distorted guitar, like acoustic stuff. Um, I think it's a very interesting record, and I think it's cool that they're beside each other because they're both very important to that other side yeah. of earache. It wasn't always about intense extreme. It could have been more, you know, this was extreme in its own way. It was right. stoned extreme. There you go. I like it. Stoned and extreme. Dude, I like we gotta it. We got to create another fucking branch on the tree <laughs> now. Thanks for that. Well, okay, there you go. We've got a couple of additions branching out beyond the death metal and grind core core, if you will, of the earache catalog. But Lisa, there's still a lot of bands here we haven't even got to. I know, we haven't talked about Deicide yet. Um, right. We talked about The Haunted. I know it's one of your favorite bands, but I'm sorry it's not coming up. Hmm. Um, but I'm seeing that means some... I'm just going to have to fucking throw that one over there. <laughs> Take it home, stick it on the fridge. <laughs> I'm seeing some love for Akrokaki. Okay, Rain Without End says, Akrokaki, words that go unspoken. Really phenomenal record. Should find a place. Easily one of the most musically adventurous extreme metal albums I've ever heard. I do think Akrokaki is a band that tends to go uh, unnoticed and they totally. deserve more. Will M, words that go unspoken, deeds that go undone by Akrokaki should be on there. It is certainly my favorite release on Earache. I love how those dudes do a progressive style of blackened death Metal. I'm gonna write it over here. What are your thoughts on, I, on this I, album? I agree that it sounds very different. It's definitely uh, adventurous. Yeah. Um, and you know, it's interesting that you say it doesn't get a lot of cred because I don't think it does get a lot of cred. No. It's interesting. We don't it, have a magnet for it. You know. It kind of falls under the radar, but it, you know, it's a good point. It's got this progressive black metal vibe that certainly when the record came out, it really stood out as being quite different. I mean, I remember. 
having to take some time to kind of wrap my head around it because it was so diverse. Delicious Dishes agrees, Akrokaki, Words That Go Unspoken, is probably the most interesting album that came out under Earache and has a giant influence in underground black metal as well as Black and Death. So yeah, some good, a good case being made for this record. A bit of a unsung hero, if you will, of the uh, Earache catalog. So uh, here's something that's come up to think about as we try and make this top 15. If a band's best work wasn't on Earache, even if we like the record, do they belong on the essential Earaches list? Which is what people are saying about Deicide and possibly also Sleep. No. No. <laughs> I think that... Because that just makes our job even fucking harder, which is not what we need right now. But point... Uh, uh, point taken, and we mentioned, you know, the most recent Carcass album, Surgical Steel, which in my opinion actually might be their best record, but I get hung up to dry for that, uh, is not going to be on here because it's You heard it here first. <laughs> Same done. <laughs> it's not an earache album. Uh, Lisa mentioned Deicide, of course, has released albums on earache, but uh, if, you're, if you're thinking about non-earache albums, doesn't make the cut. We're honoring the label, not the band this week. So we need to stick point. to the plan, people. Uh, Lisa, are we ready to move forward in decades? Because we don't have a lot of time. We are, okay. and when we get to the 2000s, one band comes up to the top. Okay, probably one of the most talked about bands in the last year, of course, as ushering in a very uh, fresh, style of progressive thrash metal, of course, is Vector. Here we go. Nick Araviano, Vector Terminal Redux. The newest record on this list. Many, including Banger, regarding it as an instant classic, and it's not hard to see why. Give the band some time, and I feel they will be kings of the scene and earache, uh, an earache legend. Daniel Crow, Vector needs to be moved way up the list. They are the heirs to Voivod's Prague sci-fi thrash without being a total ripoff. It's close, but it's not, except for the logo, which is way too close to Voivod. Terminal Redux kills. Uh, Joseph Senzik, Ve Vector is the first band to actually influence thrash and give it a new sound besides when Black Thrash and Death Thrash came about. And Dr. Gebemol, Vector, uh, was way too overhyped in my honest opinion. Weigh in. Uh, Terminal Redux obviously is, I believe, their only true earache release. It's not their first, it's their third, I believe. Right. Um, it's an unbelievable album, and for me, tying it back to my love for Thrash, this record kind of brought back Thrash in a totally new way for mm -hmm. me. It was more technical than I've ever heard it. The record clocks in at well over an hour, which is totally cool for the genre. Mm -hmm. Like only fucking, you know, there's very few bands putting out thrash records that are over an hour these days. Right, right. Um, I think that the sci-fi theme in the lyrics is unbelievable. It's a concept album, mm -hmm. Wicked Story, super complex songwriting, tons of harmonies all over the place. A very, very fucking cool new record and definitely deserves its place uh, on this board uh, amongst these legends because I think they are going to be one of the next uh, biggest biggest players in modern metal. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think this is maybe a sign of things to come uh, at Earache. I think this is arguably the the best critically received Earache record that's come out in the last few years. I think it surprised a lot of people uh, at just how much attention it got. I mean, I reviewed it in Overkill Reviews. Uh, I, think, I think there's better albums to come from Vector uh, than this album, but this is not about Vector, it's about Earache, and I think you're right. I think as time passes, I think this is one of those bands that will become better appreciated totally. as, as time passes on. So, Vector is up there. Where are we at? How many we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I'm gonna have to move this over here because <laughs> I don't think my little compilation is gonna make the cut. But we've got twelve. We need fifteen. We haven't got a lot of time. We have it. What's next? Should we consider Cult of Luna's Somewhere Along the Highway? Okay, Hannah Klein. Uh, Cult of Luna's Somewhere Along the Highway must be on this list since it's one of the best, maybe even the best record in the entire post-metal branch. The record itself is so cohesive, deep, and masterfully written, taking you on a journey over endless deserted highways, exploring true loneliness 
and desolation. Sorry, I got lost for a moment, but I might have listened to this record too often. A true masterpiece that needs to be on the board. That's a really great comment, Hannah. Thank you. Mikhail Lopez, uh, Somewhere Along the Highway, released in 2004, is a mixture of post-metal and prog-metal. It shows the fact that Eric was able to evolve with the times. It speaks well about them. And I think we've got one more here. Jarno Glass, Cult of Luna's uh, The Beyond post-metal ahead of its time just blew me away. Thoughts? I think it's a, a band as a whole, Cult of Luna is a very interesting group. Yep. Um, for me, it's a little outside of my radar with what I, I listen to on a daily basis. Yep. So, you know, perhaps I disagree, but I don't want to discredit that it's a very creative band and what they do with the post-metal sound is very interesting. Right. Uh, there you go. I also not a band that I'm, I'm very familiar with, uh, but clearly uh, there's some strong opinions. And I, in my 12, I did leave off Akrakaki, which might be a contender for the 15, maybe Nocturnus, not quite sure. So there we go. I think we have... We have 12, we've got maybe uh, Akrakaki is a 13th, Nocturnus would be a front runner. Do we add a second Carcass album? I think is an important question to consider. Lisa. One more. Yes. I'm, I'm actually quite surprised this wasn't uh, DK's uh, guest choice. I think maybe you were super confident this would make it without you, but it hasn't come up until just now. Municipal Waste. Municipal Waste, Art of Party. He's gonna fuck you up! <laughs> Rockstar1123, what about Municipal Waste, Art of Partying? A great crossover thrash record that put MW on the map. Not only an essential Municipal album, but an essential Earache album has to be here. Cameron, Great Crib, Art of Partying. That album gave me realization that thrash was alive as it turned me into a thrash fiend when I first heard it when I was younger and they were from my state. Welcome, Virginia. Virginia. Maybe, that's our, uh, maybe that's our man Kevin chiming in. I'm not sure. Uh, go. I know you love this record. I love it. It's short. It's sweet. It's perfect. It uh, guitar tones, production. It's tight as fuck. They trim all the fat. Uh, in a quote from Ryan Waste, we took what bands were doing with six minute songs and got it down to two minutes. I think they made the crossover thrash thing fun again. The album's incredibly accessible. The artwork, the imagery, the lyrical content, it slays. I love this record. For me, it is uh, a fucking Bible of what crossover in a modern sense is supposed to sound like. And if you've never seen them live, what the fuck is wrong with you? They're one of the best live bands. Get out and see them. They're putting out a new record right now. They just released a new single. Fucking unreal. Great Maybe band. I introduced you, Daniel DK, yeah. Municipal Wastes agent. Yeah, dude, they fucking <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Akrakaki, maybe. Cult of Luna, maybe. Nocturnus, maybe. Maybe another carcass record. So we got two spots to fill. Let's tidy this up. I don't like that black spot in the middle. Yes, Lisa, help me so, out. So uh, since I have to read the entire board, yes. not just the things I like, yes. um, I'm going to say that Nocturnus is a yes. Nocturnus it's is like a yes. An overwhelming okay. yes. We're going to move. Cool. Let's let's write Nocturnus here then. The key, I believe, was the album title. I got to check it out. Clearly, I, I need to do some homework. This. Yeah. We'll open a brew and crank the key. Nocturnus the key, there we go. So we got 14. We got not one so spot. Not so sure about Municipal Waste. Not, not okay. a ton of love there as an essential <laughs> era okay. record. Sorry. Nice try, Agent. So Jody Sensick says no Municipal Waste. Not essential. And their albums are more, more like fun playlists. Less than amazing albums uh, that like currently on the board. Wait a Whoa, what, what, dude! What's wrong with a fun playlist? <laughs> I just, just what's wrong with that? Unthinkable that someone agrees with him. But anyway, <laughs> uh, okay. Municipal waste is a maybe. Is a maybe so sure? maybe we have an opening for uh, two spots. We're down to thirteen. We've added Nocturnus. Do I have it right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Okay, we don't have a lot of time. I, I fe feel that Cult of Luna and a second carcass record would make people happy. Okay, this is the moment in the show where I start to feel like an auctioneer. Going once, going <laughs> <Yes>. twice. <laughs> Do, no you, do you want to win the meat draw or not? <laughs> uh, you got to chime in. Is Terrorizer on there for sure? Yeah. Terrorizer. Totally. There. Fuck yeah. Okay, I think, well, let's just, let's just do this. <laughs> uh, someone is pointing out that, ear it's that earache is not about fun playlists. Ah, good Clever. point. Although, if you listen to their like current roster, 
Yeah. Very different. Very, the, where the label's at now is very different than what we're doing. If you notice, none of really the, aside from Vector, I believe we don't really have uh, any of the like, you know, current catalog from the last few years on here. They're a very yeah. different label today. Sure. But I mean, you know, we're focusing on some of the more legendary stuff, I suppose. Yeah, well, we've got one spot remaining. Nocturnus the Key has been officially added. The only one we didn't have a, a, a magnet pre-prepared for. Is it municipal waste? No one talks about brutal truth. I noticed. We've I guess added that a wasn't... second. We have two carcass records. Is it Akrakaki? Is it Cult of Luna? What is it, Lisa? Does decapitate? What are people saying? Counts? Let's look. Okay, here Let's we go. Take a look. Municipal waste of time. The haunted made me do it. Hello. Right what about on. decapitated winds of creation, dudes? I've got the fucking magnet. How old were they? Three when yeah. they put out this record? It's like the don't like 15 started. years old. It's Decapitated crazy. is amazing. Uh, haunted, don't Enforcer. dare take off. Municipal Waste, Akrakaki, Wood, Wood of Ypres, <laughs> Cult of Luna, Decapitated. Decapitated. Worm Rot, we've seen Worm that. Worm Rot's been up a few times. This is my favorite part we get I'm, to read. I'm the surprised there's no, it. we've got Extreme Conditions here from Brutal Truth. I'm pretty surprised there hasn't been some consensus there. DSI, Vader, oh, Vader. Man, don't get me started. We have to do this again. Uh, we have to do the next 15. Akrakaki, Decapitated, I mean, Decapitated, we're hearing uh, Nihility, Winds of not, um, not Winds of Creation. I'm um, seeing mostly at this point, Cult of Luna, maybe the Fudge DSI tunnel, record, and, um, and, and Worm Rot, maybe. Okay, well, this is where we get into that awkward dead air <laughs> moment on the show, and I don't know what to do. Well, too nice, like, you don't want to upset headlines. anyone. There's one spot everyone. left, right? Is that it? Massacre from Beyond, dude. Yes. One spot. Winds of Creation is not Earache? Is that true? Fact check? Not sure. It's it's released on a subsidiary label, I uh, believe. Yeah. It's part of the Earache and okay. That's why I asked if it counts or not. I'm not sure. What are, what are we saying, Lisa? I need you to help me out here because I'm... I'm actually seeing executive an, decision. Add decapitated. We got 15. There you go. <laughs> there you go. What do you think? Talk about this record. Wind, uh, <laughs> Winds of Creation. It's their first record. It. Uh, their kids, as you said, like 15 years old, yeah. and they recorded this yeah. record or something. Uh, Peter from Vader actually produces it, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, it's unbelievable. I think that they are hailed as tech death kings for a reason. This record is such an indication of the skill. Um, they were clearly like, uh, when I started playing guitar, there were those kids that were just like miles ahead better than me and like totally yeah. put me down all the time because they were better. It was these guys <laughs> way better at their instruments than anyone else. Yeah. Uh, and they like were screaming tech. it to you in Polish, which yeah. is even worse because <laughs> you didn't actually understand what Not the fuck they were saying. Not a clue what they were, they were saying. fucking saying. Uh, amazing band. Just released a single from the new record. This band is, a f is phenomenal. I think it, for me, it was a demonstration that Earache could actually kind of, there's a bit of a full circle here, could kind of return to where they started with some of these early death metal records and really, you know, kind of helped support that, that uh, the Polish death metal thing that happened with, with Vader as well. Okay. So, I, yes. I, you know, it's hard here in the last, Well, we're like, Canadian, we like to make friends too. Yeah, so. we don't want to create It's enemies. hot in the studio, so I'm trying to count here. Akrakaki and Cult of Luna are included or not? Not included. Okay, well, they definitely have way more support than the decapitated. So After I, that whole diatribe, please. I'm not good at math. <laughs> I'm not good at math. So is it Akrakaki or Cult of Luna? I'm seeing more Akrakaki here, but that might be just because Akrakaki people are louder and more obnoxious, and that's entirely possible, because I happen to like them, and I'm obnoxious. Uh, <laughs> what do we got here? Massacre. I don't know. I might take off sleep, to be honest. Sleep? With you. Oh, we're gonna remove now. It's okay. We'll get stoned and listen to it later. <laughs> like as an essential earache record? Yeah. I don't know, guys. Essential, essential, essential. Very important for stoner. Very do do? important for diversity. It's completely their sound. falling apart here. <laughs> it's completely uh, falling apart. Is it decapitated? Municipal enforcer. waste hey, seems so to many have people just... love enforcer. It's awesome. Cult of Luna. Acrocopy. Sam, done. You're gonna have to pull some rank. Okay, yeah, dude, pulling, you're in charge. I'm pulling some rank here. Um, yeah, let's go. I think we have to go. Uh, I think. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Earache Records Top 20 albums. <laughs> <laughs> We're nothing if not indecisive on um, on Lockhart. I think we've got to honor Acrocopy. 
for the reason that this is a story about earache and this demonstrates some breadth uh, to the label and a real, a, a real progressive album and a bit of an outlier in that sense for the label. So I think for the story, if we were treating this as a story of earache, I think that would be very important. And for that reason, I think it would be a real toss up between these two, but I think in the interest of like breadth, and just demonstrating what earache has contributed to metal and covering as much ground as we can stylistically, I think we have to put Cult of Luna up here. So there you go. Sometimes somebody's just got to be the boss. From the humble beginnings of <laughs> uh, a bedroom label putting out grindcore records uh, yep. to a uh, full-on doom metal, post-metal, extreme death yep. metal, they've done it all, man. We, co we covered uh -oh. it all. I <laughs> I've upset the balance in the universe, though, by removing sleep. I'm sorry, that was me. It's dead. I was trying to make sleep, room. Uh, sleep, I was trying to sleep. Make room. Okay, do we remove the second carcass record then? Oh. Put sleep back up. Oh, see, oh. compromise. Hey, I mean, maybe that's. What do you say? What's, what's the board saying for that? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> take Evile off. We can't take Evile off. That's my guess choice. I'm not Fuck entirely Evile. sure that's the right decision because. Carcass is a band that forged two completely different musical paths within metal uh, within the span of just a few years. I do struggle with that, but it's not the story of Carcass. It is the story of Earache. <laughs> and if we're going by, we want to demonstrate the breadth. I think we add sleep on there. And you know what, Lisa? Final answer. This is the top 15. The top 15 most essential Earache records of all time. In no particular order, <laughs> Bolt Thrower, Realm of Chaos, Enter the Grave, Evile, Napalm Death, Scum, The Legend, reminder, Terrorizer, World Downfall, Entomb, Left Hand Path, God Flesh, Street Cleaner, Morbid Angel, Alters of Badness, Carcass, Heartwork, At the Gate, Slaughter of the Soul, Nocturnus, The Key, uh, cathedral, cathedral. Remind me of the title. Force of Equilibrium. Force of Equilibrium. Uh, we got Vector, uh, Terminal Redux, Sleep Holy Mountain, correct? Yes. Akrakaki, I forget. It's such a long title. You know the one. It fucking rules. And Cult of Luna. There you go. Did we survive? Do we, we still it. have? Do we still have friends? We always have friends. Carcass is earache, and earache is carcass. I like that comment. Let's just say I'm glad fucking Cannibal Corpse didn't come up. I know, right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we've been here a long time. I think we have a chart. A couple things uh, before we go. Mm -hmm. Just want to talk about Eric 2017. What's going on with the label today? Uh, Daniel, do you know? Yeah, I just saw <laughs> recently they did, uh, they're bringing uh, an earache curated heavy metal stage to Glastonbury. Okay. Um, I think that that's pretty cool. Very cool. They're, they're doing it on an old train. Very like cool. they're using that to build the stage, I believe. Yeah. Uh, something obviously cool for a festival that had never really been dominated by extreme metal, of sure. course. And now, as you can see, we've got fucking Napalm Death front and center. That's pretty cool. The Earache Express stage, I like that. Looks pretty cool. Extreme noise terror. Never came up in the debate. We're not gonna open we're that not, up again. We're not opening that debate. We've moved on. Yeah, we've moved on. Very um, cool, very cool. Yeah, they've got uh, Craig, uh, Banger Craig was telling me earlier mm -hmm. they've got a book coming out right. uh, with like alternate album covers and just, I guess, behind the scenes kind of stories. Yep. They're putting that out themselves. That's pretty cool. Um, they've got a lot of new records coming out. I mean, we didn't really talk about it, but they do. Yeah. They've got huge bands on their label right now. They've got like Rival Sons, which is right. like a huge rock and roll band. I uh, yeah. just toured for like two and a half years with Black Sabbath every night. Yeah. Super cool. Um, tons of good new metal on. Enforcer came up a bunch. You know, right. It's a right. modern metal band that's on that label. Um, so they're still very active. They've definitely widened their horizons musically. They've come a long way, as I keep saying, from a bedroom label, right? It's very cool to watch the development of such a legendary record label. I'm stoked that we got to go over the catalog, you know, just a, a fraction of the catalog yeah, today. for sure. Well, thank you, Eric. I, I think I speak for a lot of people that <clears throat> we may not be here without you. A lot of these records were absolutely essential to our, uh, our love affair uh, with metal music, and we continue to go back to these early albums. Lisa, are we ready to sign off? We're signing off. Okay, thank you, Daniel DK. It's thank been you, a pleasure. Sam. Lisa, Daniel, Craig, and Andrew, thanks for helping us uh, make it happen. Subscribe to the channel, it's Banger TV. Go to our YouTube page if you are watching this uh, live. Lockhorns is back next week, back to Thursday. And it's another albums debate. Essential albums, industrial metal. 
with Jairus Khan. Join us then on Lockhorns. Thanks for joining us. See you next week.